I think we're going to get started. Welcome. Let there we go. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Daniela Bleichmar. I direct the Levan Institute for the Humanities at USC. And we are here today to uh, for a book chat about my colleague Paul Lichterman's uh, brand new book, How Civic Action Works, Fighting for Housing in Los Angeles. Uh, thank you for joining us. We do invite everyone to turn on their camera if possible. It's very nice to see who is here and to feel in community, even if we continue to be these small little squares on the screen. So please do uh, turn on the camera if you are able to. Um, today, uh, the format of our conversation is very simple. We will be here for one hour. Um, we will start with brief comments about the book by Paul, uh, who is a professor, as you all know, professor of sociology and religion at the University of Southern California. And then we are very glad to welcome uh, to this event, to USC virtually, uh, two colleagues who Paul has invited to um, uh, uh, as interlocutors to discuss the book. Uh, Florence Fauché, who is professor of political science at Sciences Po and also uh, associate fellow at Nuffield College in uh, the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford, as well as Gary Fine, who is James E. Johnson Professor of Sociology at Northwestern University. After a conversation, uh, maybe 25 minutes, uh, between Paul, Florence, and Gary, moderated by Patricia Riley, who is Associate Professor of Communication and Director uh, of the Master's Degree Program in Global Communication at USC. Uh, we will open it up for questions from the audience. Please use your uh, hand function so that Patty can keep track uh, of the order in questions. And uh, without further ado, Paul, uh, we are here to celebrate your new book. So please uh, tell us about it. Okay, thanks so much, Daniela. It's wonderful to see you all. Many thanks to the Levin Institute for uh, inviting the conversation. And of course, a big thanks to Florence, Gary, and uh, Patty for making a discussion possible. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, Gary and Florence both are wonderful uh, scholars of and thinkers about civic life. So I'm thrilled that they were up for joining this uh, conversation. And Patty is uh, organization scholar par excellence and organizations are a big part of what I was studying. So again, thank you all. Thanks as well to the Equity Research Institute for co-sponsoring. And a special shout out to people who are joining this LA-based discussion from distant time zones. Um, I think maybe the best thing for me to do uh, is uh, talk really informally uh, to give you a couple of takeaways from the book. Um, this may be a very counterintuitive book. It's, it's about social advocates campaigning for more affordable housing and against displacement from uh, neighborhood gentrification. And a lot of readers would want to know, well, did these advocates win or lose and why? And in Los Angeles, with its many thousands of unhoused people and years of alarm over the cost of housing, uh, these, seem like, these seem like obvious questions. Uh, for five decades, social scientists have thought the same thing. We have tended to treat social advocates as strategic players who either uh, win or lose, and we ask why. And we tend to assume that activists have goals, and then they decide how to organize themselves in whatever is the most efficient and powerful way to meet those goals. That's the only rational way to look at it, right? Uh, that's a very impoverished way to look at it, I'd say. How, how Civic Action Works takes just the opposite approach. The book is starting on the notion that first social activists settle on a way of organizing themselves, a mode of working together. 
a kind of solidarity really. And that mode of working together shapes the goals that advocates come up with, not the other way around. For scholars, this is a big switch. The book is inviting us to listen closely to unfolding interaction in settings of social advocacy. And I did that in three housing coalitions and a variety of projects addressed to homelessness over four or five years time. And I asked how are activists articulating claims? How are they building relationships? These are the two indispensable arts of social problem solving. They're at the center of what John Dewey called democracy as a way of life. And put briefly, that's the high-minded reason for the book's focus, and I endorse that. There are other reasons that the interaction itself matters. If we only ask who won and why, we're assuming we already know what counts as a win, what counts as being strategic, for whom, on what timeline. Those are narrow and risky assumptions to make. When you follow the action closely, you discover that advocacy campaigns run on the basis of some very powerful meanings. And being strategic means quite different things in different organizations. The meanings aren't just random. The book has portrayed a variety of patterns of meaningful patterns of working together or what it calls styles of civic action. And it focuses mainly on two. One of those styles I call the community of identity and the other, the community of interest. People who got the readings beforehand read an example of a community of identity. These are, these are two different worlds of meanings regarding what is strategic, who is a good leader, who counts as a good ally, what's the timeline for achieving something we call success. These produce very real and sometimes painful dilemmas and trade-offs, each of these styles. It's not just about wins and losses in any absolute sense. These are cultural patterns that help explain, for example, why some activists argue very bitterly and diminish their own prospects when they actually agree on a lot of positions on paper. There's another kind of cultural pattern very quickly I'll talk about that you discover by watching and listening closely. Uh, social advocates can't just say whatever they privately think about housing problems in order to attract supporters. Some kinds of rhetoric simply sounds strange because advocates like the rest of us live inside larger cultural parameters. In LA, advocates commonly talked about homelessness as a compassion problem. Why don't we say more often that homelessness is a justice and opportunity problem? Not for any natural reason, uh, but because there are cultural expectations regarding different kinds of problems. These change only slowly. Housing and homelessness sound like different issues, even to a lot of the advocates that I was following in the study. These are matters of public rhetoric that I'm talking about, claims making, and they have very practical consequences for building coalitions and attracting public support. So in short, the book has, has a big message for scholars that we benefit from some fresh starting points if we want to understand what social advocacy accomplishes. And it also has messages for practical minded readers and both of these sets of takeaways emerge from doing what is sometimes inconvenient, but always fascinating, which is following the action. And I should leave it at that and uh, open things up. Excellent. We can um, have comments now from our interlocutors. If uh, we could have um, Florence start. Thank you. Well, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to discuss this book and for the opportunity, opportunity to be with you in, in LA. Um, I, sus I suspect I wouldn't be here without the pandemic um, and I'd rather be with you in LA, but anyway, that's, that's good nevertheless. <laughs> um, um, I want to start just by saying that this is a fantastic book and um, I've, um, um, I've taken great pleasure and uh, in trying to get into it and because I think it's a book that uh, 
um, provide so much food for thought that I will be mulling it over for a little while for my own research. Um, it's, I wasn't that surprised, Paul, to see that um, uh, it, it had uh, the similar insight and qualities that I'd found in your previous work. So that was, that was really good. And um, in particular, what you bring um, uh, through the, uh, the very thick descriptions that you provide, you allow us reader to uh, understand scenes and context that for me at least are completely alien. I mean, I know nothing about the communities, the actors, the context uh, um, that you talk about, that you observe. And so it's, it's a really uh, fascinating um, work of anthropology of the modern world. But you do that and at the same time, beyond the, uh, and thanks to the, uh, the very thick description where we can see the world through the eyes and through um, the minds um, almost of uh, your, your activist, you also raise and you point to very important theoretical um, directions, which allow us to, uh, to think about the role of culture in um, orienting, in shaping uh, how we do things, how we interact, but also how interactions create situations that are always to an extent, even though they're deeply structured by this cultural pattern, are also full of um, um, contingency, full of chance um, as people interact. Uh, so, um, I, uh, um, I learned a lot about uh, civic action in LA. And um, the first point I, I want to, um, uh, to raise maybe is to, to reflect on your, your position on civic action and how you, you position yourself in the uh, discourse field uh, of uh, the discipline of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, US sociology, um, social sciences being dominated by uh, particular uh, approaches and in particular the actor centeredness and strategy and so on. So I think it's very interesting to actually turn also somehow uh, what you look at to ourselves and to reflect on how um, you have to, the, the, the claims that you're making are, um, are also situated and so on. And what I really like in your approach is how it invites us to transpose, um, um, not directly, but to transpose the same kind of um, toolbox to different settings. But I don't want to monopolize uh, the microphone. No, I, I, I think you've started to address some of the questions you're raising, so I love it. And um, yeah, it, it, I, I want to take that as an invitation to say a little bit about what civic and civic action means, because these are very freighted terms in U.S. sociology, but also in U.S. public life. There's a tremendous amount of uh, idealized, romanticized talk about things that social scientists call civic. And in fact, in a later chapter of the book, I talk about some of those and they seep into our politics also, the assumption that uh, whatever is civic and therefore not governmental is better and more efficient and closer to real people. And I try to blow apart a lot of those assumptions, especially in the chapter on affordable housing developers. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a difficult uh, question because there's so there's so many layers of meaning to what is civic, and the book is grounded in an understanding of civic that exactly as you say is action centered. It's not about you know what people believe or what things people would tick off on paper. Is civic is is uh, I, I take a very uh, action centered focus and define civic action as collective action that people are pursuing, more or less voluntarily to address problems that they think should matter to some broader public. Okay, so more or less flexible collective action people pursue 
uh, to address problems they think should matter to some bigger public. That's quite different from what was really uh, the mode for a lot of US social science for roughly 20 years, which is uh, not to start with action, but to uh, start in a way that makes sense if you're counting, if you're doing statistical work, you're counting groups, you're counting relationships, and you're assessing civic life according to um, whether there are many or only a few citizen groups in a society. You're using the metaphor of social capital, uh, wildly popular uh, a concept in U.S. sociology that, again, is a matter, if you're studying uh, civic life as social capital, then you're, you're counting groups and counting relationships, and you're saying that a region or a nation or a city has more or less social capital if it has more or fewer civic groups. You're cutting out everything that I was trying to study and do think description of in the book, which is um, but what are they doing? How are they doing it? How are they interacting together? The how questions evaporate if we're simply counting. Are there more or fewer members? Are there more or fewer groups? You can address some interesting questions that way. I don't say that the civic capital, uh, that the social capital concept is simply useless, but there's a limited range of questions you can ask, and really none of them are about meanings. Okay, you can make correlations between, you know, number of groups or number of members and various outcomes, but there are a lot of questions about how and about what things mean that you don't ask if you're using that concept. But nevertheless, it was a powerful one in US sociology. I don't know if it diffused so widely to French social science, but it was a big one here. The, the other dimension that uh, really struck me was how what you're looking at um, would, would make perfect sense probably for most of my colleagues working uh, and who define themselves actually as political sociologists and who work on uh, how issues, uh, social issues are being politicized or depoliticized and the kind of wrangling that uh, leads to, uh, uh, to uh, um, policymakers seizing an issues and deciding that uh, a response needs uh, to uh, to be developed, and so the boundaries, um, the the disciplinary boundaries also would be shifted here, which means that I think there's much more uh, openness uh, to reflecting on this. Uh, porosity between uh, different types of actors, because basically there is much more focus on the emergence of an issue, for instance, and how it is seized and how people compete. Uh, but at the same time, I think the um, um, the angle that you bring on um, on these, um, uh, these the styles uh, in particular and the scenes is very original and very important because it's quite rare to actually take so seriously, uh, even you know, in the kind of uh, context of let's say European or continental uh, political science where there's much more sensitivity to this question. It's very rare to take into account really the kind of structures, difficult to pin down but, and difficult to see, but at the same time, you really manage to um, highlight how they inform, how they shape, how they, uh, they restrict um, the way people can articulate their points, but also how they can how they can talk to each other. Um, yeah, structures of interaction, you might say. And again, these are very powerful and, and advocates themselves don't tend to talk about them very much. When it comes to frustrations, uh, uh, conflicts, very often people uh, in the advocacy world will say, we're having this conflict because we have different ideologies or because there are personalities that are difficult to work with. And what I kept finding is that that's the language, that's the common sense language that a lot of advocates like the rest of us have to talk about problems. We don't so often talk about the ground on which we walk. We don't talk about these assumptions about interaction. What are we doing together? You know, what are we trying to do collectively and what does that mean? But those clashes over those meanings 
these structures of interaction, how should we should interact, what style we should interact. And those are often at the core of some, you know, very, very big conflicts and uh, uh, coalitions that I was studying. So yes, I do hope that people find it useful to look further to those. Um, I think you're about to say something. Yeah, I, I, I was about to say that um, the, um, um, I think we can't see these structures precisely because we're so immersed in them that yeah. they, they're too much in our face to actually be consciously thinking about, oh, this, you know, this is how I'm actually judging the situation, which allows me to actually um, think that this is going to be the most appropriate way of uh, bringing an issue uh, and interacting in, you know, with uh, and judging somehow the uh, the other participants. So that's um, that's the first point I wanted to to add. But the second one is about taking into account the uh, the power dimension that there is in imposing or inflecting the use of a style or of a discourse uh, discourse field over another because as you manage as one manages to do that as an actor one restricts also of course what other what interlocutors can actually say I mean it's the classic in a way it's a classic that third dimension of power of the loops to actually consider how one restricts what people can imagine because what you're actually pointing to is that this these stars also affect what one can imagine one can what one can say and but also what one can imagine yeah yeah it's no crazy. absolutely in fact that's one other, I think that that's a useful insight if you want to understand, for instance, why is it that progressive or even left oriented advocates here in Los Angeles would so rarely say out loud, you know, there are capitalist property relations that give big developers a lot of power. I, I heard, uh, you know, through, through field work, that kind of language came up exactly twice. Right in in months and months of field work, it's not that some advocates didn't think. Yeah, there are some structured inequalities that our economic system uh, produces that give property developers much more power than tenants. But when it comes to to speaking, uh, uh, you know, speaking these, uh, that's you can't say things like that because that would violate a style in which people assume we are a community that is fighting the powers that be and we want to uphold and promote the community we don't want to talk about systematic property relations that would be getting away from the community that is fighting local developers and trying to preserve itself i see that it's time to bring gary in so yes, I, no and and yeah. and that is a good point to bring me in on um I, the first thing I want to say is, you know, I, to agree how significant this book is, but even more than that, to just note the importance of the research of theory that Paul has done over the course of a quarter century, and and we would be uh, amiss if we didn't mention his writing partner, his theoretical partner, uh, Nina Eliasov, who's who's together their work and separately their work has transformed the way that we combine a micro meso sociological view of civic action with something that is more organized and more structural. So I, I wanted to bring that out at first, the connection between politics and culture that has developed in the course of your research, Paul, over the last quarter century. But the, what I wanted to bring up in light of the comments that, that you and Florence were making was you, you start by saying that there is a need for a bigger box that is a, a wider perspective and a, a larger domain of action. And in uh, current debates about ethnography, you have scholars like uh, Matthew Desmond talking about the need, the importance of a relational ethnography. That is not to focus on a single group, 
which has been my tradition uh, over the course of my career, but to look at the way that organizations intersect with each other and groups intersect. And in reading this, this really terrific uh, uh, account, I, I kept on wondering about, if I can call it the other side, Mm -hmm. Really, there are multiple other sides. But in, in thinking about uh, landlord groups, government agencies, uh, groups that are suspicious of or oppose the demands of ISLA or housing justice, that they have values as well. They have traditions as well. They have styles as well. And, and yet they, they intersect at important moments with this group. And if there's a second volume to come out. I, I don't want to say that there's something missing, but but if there was more to do here, it would be to look at the way that those groups and these groups find a, a ground on which they can disagree often and agree occasionally. And I wonder if you can speak to that, that broader issue of, of politics in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And there are a couple of things to say. One, I think, is in regards to civic action, sometimes there's a kind of sneaking suspicion people might have that civic really means people and groups we approve of. Uh, that may mean uh, in academic audiences more often than not uh, progressive oriented groups or something like that. And I wouldn't want to say that at all. Right wing groups, conservative groups, uh, 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 are doing civic action too. So it's, it's not a politically, uh, politically enclaved concept. And yeah, certainly, you know, uh, business interests uh, that uh, organize collectively with some amount of, you know, leeway to address problems they think should matter to larger audiences, they're doing civic action too. So it's it's not just, you know, quote unquote groups we mm -hmm. like who do uh, progressive groups uh, that do civic action. That other side does come into the book. And uh, I do try to show that shared ground that, for instance, uh, representatives of uh, property developers, uh, the shared ground that they had with the uh, uh, housing advocates, with the tenants' rights groups. Mm -hmm. And that comes up in the, in the chapter where I'm talking about what kinds of arguments do they make at City Hall. When there mm -hmm. are debates at City Hall about, uh, you know, should this massive apartment complex be approved for development? Should we uh, pass regulations that would mandate set-asides of affordable housing in buildings of a certain size throughout Los Angeles. You know, there were different sides on mm -hmm. these issues and they did have a shared ground. That was the discursive field that they were operating in. They all made, uh, with, with literally very, very few exceptions, a few, they all made arguments in terms of either uh, fair opportunity or quality of life. Mm -hmm. The uh, representatives of big developers did it. We deserve the opportunity to uh, continue building and stay in business. And you know the city yeah. needs that. Just as the other side made fair opportunity arguments about the opportunity for housing we can afford. There's a shared ground there. And uh, yeah, both sides were right. very largely inside this. And, and, and that raised the question in my mind about debates over gentrification. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, groups, like, particularly ISLA, was, you know, considered gentrification a major threat to the community. And, and certainly one can understand that. But in a civic world in which there are food deserts, and health deserts, you know, the gentrification, some amount of gentrification, you know, can support the needs of members of a community. Uh, and and I'm, I wondered if, you know, to whether these action groups that you're focusing on, and you're basically focusing on the the progressive groups rather than the landlord groups, whether that they recognize that you know, some amount of investment within the community is, is beneficial 
you know, even if it changes the culture, the street culture, the street life of that community. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, it depends partly on what you mean by gentrification is kind of a fabulously unclear term, but I, I think I could say in different ways, you know, the two main coalitions in the study would probably disagree with, with the premise. And I'd, I'd love to hear soon what other people in the Zoom room with us would think about this. But, you know, from the standpoint of the coalition uh, ISLA that was, uh, you know, fighting against uh, local neighborhood gentrification and displacement, I think what they would be likely to say is, if you have invest, you know, if you have investment by large property developers, then over time, yes, that might also bring in um, more grocery, more supermarkets mm -hmm. for, uh, and and maybe more medical clinics also, uh, for instance, for for a different for a different income level of residents. So, so you know, right. not for people who are displaced from that neighborhood because bringing in, uh, gentrification is going to bring in, you know, food shopping opportunities for a kind of resident that becomes more common while the people who were living there are getting displaced by uh, uh, increasing property values, raised, raised rents, and they're no longer living there. So you're solving some of the problems that you're saying gentrification That's might right. solve. Uh, for people who are moving in who don't have those problems because they can afford the supermarket, they can afford the the medical clinics, you're not solving it, uh, those issues for people who have to move out. <laughs> right. That's the unintended consequences of that. And and so, the, you know, in a way, the, the debate is, do you want neighborhoods, do you want communities in which all social classes can live in, can thrive in, or do you want particular zones, you know, particular cultural zones uh, of different classes? Yeah, the other, the, the Housing Justice Coalition, you know, they had discussions about, you know, uh, uh, looking forward to a city in which there are lots of mixed income neighborhoods and that if uh, affordable, i.e. below market rate renting apartments are available all over the city and not just in a few enclaves of the city, then you would have over time a more mixed income city. I don't think they would call that gentrification, though. I think they would say that, yeah, this is producing, you know, mixed income environments that may also encourage some entrepreneurs to, you know, open a supermarket, open a medical clinic or something where they might not otherwise. But um, it wouldn't be a sort of massive turnover of the kind that the other coalition documented in one or two neighborhoods where they said, look at in 10 years how the kinds of residents living here have changed, okay, into a different class, basically. Well, that is, as you pointed out, the, the ambiguity of the idea of gentrification. Yeah, yeah, I which... Mean, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's not a, not a, it's a folk term. It's not a real. We've right. made it into an academic term, but it's also kind of a, kind of a folk term. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's in those conversations in the interaction that I wanted to study so closely that you find out what does it actually mean, you know, and what can we say out loud about gentrification? What can we say about displacement? Um, that's why I think it's so important to pay attention to the interaction. Uh, and find out what the meanings are. Excellent. So I wanted to um, open up uh, the forum to questions from other people in our Zoom room at this point. Uh, and if you would both unmute yourself and uh, raise your hand, that would be excellent. While we're waiting for people to uh, figure out what questions they want, I've got a quick one for you. Not quick, really, Paul. Uh, I love the book, by the way. I haven't had an opportunity oh, to say you. that. Good one time. of the things that happens uh, as uh, you get into the book 
is the disjunction between uh, the people who are focused on affordable housing and gentrification issues and those problems and the people who are focused on homelessness uh, the unhoused mm -hmm. uh, starts to become more apparent in in the story and the conversation differences the vocabulary differences make themselves really apparent did you have the feeling uh, in the observer and as the writer putting this together that these were um, almost incompatible in some ways, another kind of dilemma, as you described dilemmas mm. in the book so well? Yeah, you, you mean uh, between people who are working on affordable housing versus addressing homeless? Yeah, I think there, there were several there were several divides. There are several different kinds of collective efforts that I study, different kinds of civic efforts fo focused on homelessness. And if you start with the one that you might think of as more traditional, sort of church-based or let's say uh, religious congregation-based approaches to homelessness, there's a very traditional vocabulary that a lot of people know that's still very widespread in the, in the US that uh, as I mentioned in my comments treats homelessness as a compassion problem where you focus on persons, persons that need compassion. Uh, very different from the world of talking about housing, talking about not persons, but facilities, right? And we start talking about facilities, then in the US political cultural mainstream, it makes more sense to talk about justice and opportunity. When we're talking about persons, then suddenly we're talking about compassion, not about justice. And this, this is kind of a real rhetorical split that I think contributed to the difficulties in being able to talk about homelessness and the need for more affordable housing in the same campaign. There are some other reasons too, but one of them is that these are like different discursive tracks, right? That focus us and that, that elicit different emotions even. And uh, part of the, what fascinates me about this to make, maybe bring Florence in for a sec. Uh, I know at least when I was doing the study in France uh, or let's say in Paris, there's a rather different discourse about homelessness that I became a little bit familiar with from just a tiny bit of field work with a large NGO that worked with homeless people in Paris where the language isn't about compassion, it's about social inclusion, that homelessness is a social inclusion problem. We have a social inclusion emergency. People are excluded and we need to broaden the circle of solidarity. That kind of language made sense. In Paris, it would sound, I guess, very academic in Los Angeles or in the US. So just to give an example of how different the rhetoric can be and what kinds of openings different kinds of rhetoric make for different kinds of solutions. But, but in Los Angeles, if homelessness is a compassion problem, but housing on the other hand is an opportunity problem, you see there's, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to make appeals about both uh, in, in, in the same campaign. And uh, you know, there, there were also, I'm sorry, did somebody? I should probably actually uh, uh, stop there so that we can, I, there's more to say, but let's get some other people into the conversation. I appreciate the question. I see Miriam's hand. Yes. Hello. Um, thank you so much for the fascinating conversation. And uh, thank you, Paul. I um, look forward to reading the book, really. Uh, my question is about the theoretical setup. I, I still have to read the work, uh, I should uh, say in advance, but I was wondering if you're concerned with either in the book or in general with why different styles of civic action come together and how is it that sometimes some communities base, uh, manage to uh, sort of fall back on the informal unspoken uh, principles of practice that they have developed, I don't know, maybe over the years, maybe based on a shared cultural background, a social background, and some of them either prefer or have no choice but 
enter into open, transparent dialogue and build those principles. Um, I'm working um, like this is this question is on my mind because I'm doing uh, I'm dealing with the exact same thing in the context of post revolutionary Iran, where it seemed like some politicians were just able to read each other and get along and manage without forming formal organizations while others had to go the other route. I uh, love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, it's actually several great questions. And let me just kind of toss you a few things for starters. Um, I think, you know, when, when, when people, let's say people have a meeting, uh, and it, just in the way, this is the kind of thing you would pay attention to closely, as I think you know, uh, Miriam, as, a, as an ethnographer, that people very quickly pick up on cues. And a lot of what's happening with styles of action is that, uh, just in the way that uh, a meeting is introduced, do we have a president and a vice president or do we have a facilitator? Um, are we going to say what the agenda is in advance or are we going to sit and listen for an hour while one leader talks? I mean, there's so many different cues that people pick up on so that a lot of the people in the room know pretty quickly, oh, it's one of those kinds of meetings. This is this kind of meeting where we do this kind of uh, where this is how we work together. Let me give a very specific example. In one of the coalitions I studied, several of the meetings started in this way with a kind of ritual in which um, the facilitator would ask people, stand up if you have lived in the community for five years or more. Now stand up if you've lived in the community for 10 years or more. Now stand up, okay, so you are in this meeting that's begun with this little kind of acknowledgement ritual and you get the idea, uh, among other things, that longevity in the community really matters. And that this is also very much about we who are residents in the community. It's not about an issue per se. We're not here so much to talk about housing as an issue or sustainability as an issue. We're here as the community talking about who we are and how we value our long-term ties and relationships in this. These kinds of moves that you notice as an ethnographer are incredibly powerful. I learn sometimes by making mistakes like all ethnographers do. I talk, for instance, uh, to one uh, leader about you know, the issue of housing after this kind of ritual. And then I realized later that probably sounded really flat. That's that's not that's not what the emotional tone is here. That's not what we're doing together. We're not just talking about issues. We're talking about the community who has many issues. Okay. So so by 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 tuning into these cues, as ethnographers also learn how to do, that uh, uh, a style crystallizes pretty quickly. Um, I feel like that probably starts to address one of the uh, questions I think you have about how a style comes together, um, usually pretty quickly, and people also notice other people's mistakes. And some people stop going to meetings in which people are coordinating, they're you know, discussing things in a way that doesn't quite make sense to that participant, or that seems wrong headed to that participant, they stop going. So there's a selection effect that also tends to keep uh, a style uh, established as more or less dominant in, in you know, one campaign. Uh, some campaigns, as I write about in the book, there, there's more than one style going on and people know which one to do depending on what we're talking about here. There are choices though, and you brought up the matter of choice. And this, this is something I, I think in the US context is, is a helpful thing to say. Um, people have assumed sometimes that uh, activists of color probably wouldn't have much choice except to operate as a community of identity because the kind the the way with the housing issue, for instance, because housing inequalities are so racialized uh, uh, in Los Angeles, like in other large cities and small cities in the U.S., they're so racialized that it would make sense to organize together as a community of identity in which we're working together on the assumption that we identify with each other as members of an oppressed social category, an oppressed identity. 
Yeah, but there were activists of color in the coalition that organized itself very differently in my study as a community of interest, not a community of identity. Um, that's just as a, a kind of long-winded way of saying that styles of action don't, there are usually choices. There isn't something about members uh, demographics that determines they must operate in this style rather than that one. Uh, styles and social background don't map onto each other so exactly. So, so when it comes to, you know, which kinds of people become part of which problem solving efforts that uh, uh, work on the basis of which styles, there's some amount, you know, people make different choices. And then once they're there, we'll tend to comport with the style and play because to not do so, uh, you'll learn, oh, that's not appropriate here. That's not what we're doing here. We don't talk about capitalist property relations here, even if we think privately that that's part of what's going on with in unequal development in Los Angeles, but that's not how we talk here. So. Interesting. Um, we've got a hand up, Carrie Ann. Hey, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I'm doing my PhD research uh, in part look, working with groups fighting gentrification in South LA and Inglewood. So this has just been a really useful occasion to reflect. Um, and one question I have for you is sort of, especially, you know, you're spending time with these groups, you're, you're, whether in interviews or, or meetings. And I'm wondering how you think about sort of where your how your research plays back into the conversations that these groups um, may may be having in terms of have you been able to share your analyses with the people that you talk to and if so have they had or what kind of reactions have they had yeah thank you Karen yeah a few things on that one is that um I did share my analysis in the making very lightly and I wanted to be careful about that because I was figuring things out and didn't want to do too much, you know, uh, using people who I get to know in the field as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, tests for my uh, emerging analysis. But I did occasionally uh, talk about something kind of like styles of, of action with uh, at least a couple of people in different groups that I was writing about. Sometimes I used a little different language and I found, yeah, they get it. Uh, uh, they, they get it in their own terms, what I'm talking about. So, so yeah, I think there is real potential there. I, 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 I didn't do a lot of that kind of sharing of my analysis because again, I was figuring things out and that took a while and doing this kind of ethnographic research while teaching and doing administrative work also <laughs> extends the, uh, the timeline. So quite a lot of the people uh, that I was writing about are no longer in the coalitions that I was writing about. And in one case, the coalition itself does not exist. There are similar efforts in Los Angeles, but that coalition does not exist. So those actors together would not be there for me to go and talk to. What I would say is next time, I know one of the things that I would like to be able to talk about with activists is to bring up this thing that I said before that, you know, again, we tend to judge in the activist world, we tend to judge people a lot by what's your ideology, what ideas do you think are best? And anyone who also has a kind of academic uh, viewpoint on things, you know, we, we judge people by their ideas. We think ideas make people do things. Or else we say so-and-so is hard to work with. Um, so we talk about, you know, ideas, we talk about personalities. I would encourage people to talk about how do we work together? You know, to, to, in other words, to use some of this, frankly, um, uh, an unapologetically scholarly analysis and simply use a language. And I think the style word makes intuitive sense to a lot of people who are not academics to, to speak in a straightforward way about these things we can understand as scholarly ethnographers so that people talk about how do we work together, not are we left enough? Because quite often I heard, well, you're just not left enough or mm -hmm. uh, you're not progressive enough or mm -hmm. something like that. To stop assuming that everything that happens or that's frustrating in the activist world is due to having this or that ideology and to instead say there's a power to how we work together. 
that makes something sayable and unsayable, something's doable and undoable. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about which of our frustrations might actually be a clash of styles, not a clash of ideologies. That is a conversation I would love to keep having with, having with, academic, uh, with uh, uh, advocates. Excellent. So um, I'm not seeing any hands at the moment. Am I? Oh, uh, Anne, go for it. Hey, Paul. Hey, Patty. Thank you. Hey. Paul, I too look forward to reading this book, and unfortunately, I've not had the chance to do so yet. But um, I was really fascinated by your conversation about the emotions of compassion that were expressed in your observations. And when I've been studying emotions in politics. Compassion can be very useful, but it can also be very limiting. Um, if we define things in terms of compassion and empathy, sometimes that leads to inaction and the attribution of responsibility to the individual rather than to government or other larger entities. Did you see the use of that kind of language as limiting in the um, steps to kind of problem solving? Or how did it work? You mean compassion language? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to give kind of a negative example because I think it might actually uh, address what I think you're asking even better. In the um, housing coalitions, I heard very, very rarely any kind of appeals to compassion when it was, you know, in a meeting. Uh, whether it's a meeting of the activist group on its own turf or a public and official meeting at City Hall, something like that. Very, very few appeals to compassion. Backstage, I occasionally heard people saying, it's really too bad so-and-so needs to move out of the neighborhood because she can't afford to live here anymore. That sounds kind of like compassion, right? But I heard very, very little compassion talk and determined in the book, and I show in one of the chapters how I figured this out, that it seemed like that was actually, you know, that kind of language was non-normative. We weren't supposed to sound that way because people who are proud fighters for the community shouldn't sound like uh, supplicants looking for compassion. They should sound prideful standing up for justice. Uh, so, you know, so these different languages of emotion, I think, are coded. And depending on how they're coded, they may or may not go with the style at hand. And compassion language didn't really go with the style that I call a community of identity in which people are standing up for justice for the community, not asking for compassion, even though privately people would, yeah, feel sorry that someone has to move because they've been displaced. So, um, so I think, you know, groups do some amount of their own sort of, uh, uh, you know, norm creating regarding what can we say about different emotions. Any language of emotion is going to enable some kinds of action and probably disable other kinds. So the, the in groups oriented to the style of working together, I was just talking about the community of identity. Anger was a very important emotion, anger and indignation. That's empowering in some ways but there are also some kinds of conversations that are a lot harder to have if what we're doing here is being angry at invasive outside forces that are dominating us. It's not that that's not happening, okay? It, makes, it can make sense to have that stance on the larger world, especially if you feel like you are about to be displaced by you know, a large development nearby that's gonna raise everybody's rents because property values go up. But again, there are some kinds of perspective that'll be much harder to articulate. If what we're doing here is being angry together, are we gonna be deliberative in some ways if what we're doing together is being angry? The same could go with compassion or other emotions and emotional tones that, you know, that you wanna talk about. All right, well, we've got one uh, hand up and that will be our last question. And then I'm going to ask for closing comments from Gary and Florence. Uh, Odid, go for it. Hi, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, Paul, for the talk. I, 
I haven't read the book yet, so you might answer this question, but as you, you might answer the question there already, but as you answered the question before last, you suggested that um, one of the things that you think groups should learn is how to um, work across styles. We uh, collab realize the differences are not always differences of ideology um, or just difficult people, but rather being able to work with people of different styles. But And I wonder, thinking about the term style itself, if the ability to work with people from other styles is not itself a factor of the style of the group. So if we understand styles as uh, part of style as the way the group understands who are its members and who it can work with, isn't by asking them to work across styles, you're basically suggesting in order to be able to work better together, you have to alter your style of doing things together. Like we yeah, I think I, I want to give a really quick answer because I would love to uh, hear really quickly a couple of closing comments from Gary and Florence. So, so I think really quickly, I see Odette, what you were getting at. And I think, yeah, I, I would suggest that some styles probably make it easier to integrate other groups with other styles of acting than others do, but always on that group's term. So the community of interest, for instance, you know, people would say, oh, you want to speak mainly about your own neighborhood, your own community in the community of identity sense. Sure, come and come and uh, come and speak at our rally as long as you know you can do that and other people will speak differently. That's trying to integrate other people on the terms of the speaker. Okay, so, so while some styles, while part of working together is to assume we need a big, big coalition of people who don't all work the same way. That sounds very open. That sounds like we're welcoming lots of people, but uh, it's welcoming people on the grounds of the speakers, on the grounds of the people with, the, with that particular style. So yeah, there are always going to be some limits to how you integrate other people who uh, work differently. And I guess what I would propose is it's good not to moralize any of these and to assume different styles of acting together have different offer different opportunities and different constraints. That's what a lot of what the book is trying to show. Let's become a little less moralistic about those and assume there are ways, there are reasons other people work together the way they do. And to accept that that may be good for some issues in some places for some people. What I heard quite a bit is people tend to moralize the way of acting that they have. And that would be something good to get beyond and a, a kind of more cosmopolitan sense of, you know, why we do things differently in different places. Thank you, Paul. I'm turning this back over to Daniela, who says we have a very strict end time. I am so sorry to say we have run out of time. This, I, this conversation flew by. We are exactly at time. And we are mindful that with Zoom, people have no transition time from one meeting to the other. So I want to thank our guests today, Florence Fauché, Gary Fine for your comments, your questions, Patty Riley for uh, moderating. Uh, thank you to Isabella Carr at the Levan Institute who arranges everything. And of course, to the USC Equity Research Institute, our partner today. Our last thanks and most thanks to Paul, who has given us the uh, reason to come together to celebrate his new book and has given us so much to think about. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us in this conversation. Looking forward to talking to a lot of you more. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, that's a brilliant book. Brilliant comments. Ciao.